All right, guys, to start off this build, we're gonna go ahead and broach the dial. And I like to use this triangular shaped file. I got this at Lowe's in a little hobby file set. They're not very expensive. And I do find that the triangular shaped file is better at removing material. This process is pretty straightforward. You do want to check as you, you know, go along, making sure that you don't broach the hole out too wide. Um, you know, you just need enough room to go over the cannon pinion and you don't want it too big. That way you're, you know, you don't want an unsightly gap there on your dial. So you do got to be careful, but once you're happy with the size and you have it to the appropriate uh, width, I do like to go back over with a round file. This gives it a more smooth um, look and just a better finishing overall. So I like to smooth that out and, um, you know, like I said, get, gives it a more complete look. I also like to clean as I go along with Rodico. Can't go wrong uh, using Rodico to clean as you go along. You'll find all kinds of little uh, debris. And of course, when you're working on a watch or building a watch, you need your watch base to be clean uh, and your work area to be clean. So once you have the um, hole to the appropriate size, you do want to go ahead and clean up this little burr that's on the back there. So believe it or not, that little burr um, can actually cause pretty big problems. So you want to smooth it out and make sure it's completely flat. The NH34 utilizes a dial washer and that little burr can actually put pressure on that dial washer and in turn put more strain on the GMT gear train and you can actually break the GMT gear train uh, by not removing this little burr ask me how I know I definitely um, ruined an NH34 or two when I first started modding with it so take it from me save yourself the headache and go ahead and remove this and make sure it's nice and smooth that way you don't run into that problem once you have the burr completely removed and the back of the dial is nice and, nice and flat, I like to use more Rodico to clean and air as well. Make sure everything is nice and brushed off and then go ahead and fit your dial to your movement. And it's at this point that I realize, unfortunately, this is a fake dial. I did contact Wheeze Mods before buying it. I had my suspicions. I was reassured that it is a real dial. They also had a good rating, but unfortunately I had to email them, letting them know it was fake. I'm sure that they know it's fake and I would not trust this site. Do not buy an OEM dial from them. They are 100% fake. Uh, you can pause the video here. I list all the reasons that I know this is fake, including the fact that it's supposed to be a four o'clock dial. They did send me a second dial. And one of the first things I realized was the packaging it comes in. You know, an OEM dial will come in Seiko packaging with an OEM part number in a case like that. And it won't come in a case like this aftermarket dials come in things like this so um, this was a pretty expensive dial it was $92 almost $100 and this is the second one that he sent me it was made so cheap that when I went to clean the center hole with Rodico the paint actually peeled so not only that but like I said the loom color is way off it's a white not a creamy color like the S um, PB240 is supposed to be. Not only that, but it looms green instead of looming blue at night. Regardless, this is the situation, you know, I found myself in. And so sometimes when you're modding, things don't go to plan. Um, the price was never the issue. It's the availability of this dial. It's just hard to get. So 
We're going to press on and I went ahead and removed the dial feet for the, the dial that came with the three o'clock um, dial feet. And I went ahead and cut those off and filed them down so they're nice and smooth. And then I can go ahead and use some 3M adhesive double-sided tape. This is what you get um, for bezels and stuff. I cut it down to size and I installed it on the movement spacer here, um, down at six and up at 12. So I just cut it to fit on that. And then uh, before we install our dial, we do need to install that dial washer that I previously mentioned. This does go on in a U-shape just like that. And I'll go ahead and zoom in here uh, so you can get a better look at it. And there's also a little diagram here for your reference. Once we have our dial washer installed, we can go ahead and install our dial onto the movement. The 3M tape does work pretty good. Um, I haven't used it prior to this, but it holds well and it does allow you to align your dial. So uh, you can see I'm pressing where the uh, dial feet would normally be just out of habit, but um, I really need to press that 12 and six like I am now. That way it adheres to that double-sided tape well. But it's not too big a deal. We got a decent dial and it's at four o'clock now. And it is an okay looking dial at the very least. It is a shame that it's not OEM. That's definitely what I wanted, um, but let's press on. And now I'm installing the GMT hand. This is a 1.6 size uh, hand setting tool that I got from Do It Yourself Watch Club. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description. It's a cheap tool, but the shipping is very expensive. So it's like $44 all in total to get it shipped to you, uh, plus the price of the tool. But it does make installing the GMT hand uh, pretty easy. So we're going to go ahead and line that just slightly better and then go ahead and give it a good press. And now we can go ahead and look from the side profile and make sure that the GMT hand has clearance for the indices. And it's always close with the GMT hand, but that's exactly what you want to see. Uh, you want it to be as close to the indices as possible without touching. And here are the OEM SPB 240 handset. You can kind of see what I'm talking about with that loom color. It's more of a cream. And as I mentioned before, it lights up blue at nighttime. So these are OEM hands. I got them from watchpartsplaza.com. I'll leave a link in the description to these hands as well. They're really nice. They have a bevel in the center and they are polished and brushed so you got good contrast no matter what type of lighting you're in and i really like this handset so i think it's going to look really good so now we're going to go ahead and install the hour hand very similar process i use rodico to hold it and then i use my hand setting tool to get it set so the Rodico makes it easy to align with the indice, and then you can go ahead and press it on. Once you have it on, um, you know, you can go back over and, um, you know, give it another firm press to make sure it's firmly seated and that the hand is fully installed. Once I'm happy with that, I go ahead and check from the side profile to make sure the clearance is are looking good and that the hand is straight and it looks great to me happy with how that looks and now we're going to go ahead and set our hour hand to six o'clock i find this a lot easier to make the hands aligned properly when you set the hour hand to six o'clock and then put the minute hand at the 12 o'clock marker and it's the same uh, process 
we're going to go ahead and clean the hour hand a little bit first before we install the minute hand because once we install the minute hand we won't have access to the hour hand anymore not at least not cleanly um so now that i've given it a little clean we can go ahead and install our minute hand here and like i said it's the same process except this time i use the red side of my Bergeon hand setting tool instead of that gray side. All that does is ensure that when I'm pressing on the hand, it doesn't slide too far down the cannon pinion and actually come in contact with the hour hand. So if you order a Bergeon hand setting tool with gray and red, you will definitely be able to install your hour minute hand no problem. And like I said, I like to use that gray side for the hour hand and this smaller red side for the minute hand. Because um, no matter how hard you press, you can't really mess it up because it, it won't let you go too far down on the cannon pinion. So that's a, that's a nice tip to know. Uh, so we got our minute hand installed here now. I'm going to go ahead and give it a clean as well. Just make sure it's um, doesn't have any smudges. And again, check from the side profile to make sure our clearances are good and that the hand is straight. Now we can go ahead and check our hand alignment. Of course, you wanna check all the cardinal positions at three o'clock. And we're gonna check at 12 o'clock. In this case, we wanna make sure that both hour and minute hand are lined up perfectly and our GMT hand at the six o'clock position as well, which in GMT time is 12 o'clock noon. So now we're checking at three o'clock and then we're gonna check back at 6 p.m. and make sure that our hands are lining up beautifully and they are. And again, we wanna check that um, GMT hand is right in the middle of the nine o'clock marker. Once we're happy with that, we can go ahead and install the seconds hand. So this is the way I like to do it now. I have this cheap hand setting tool. I put a piece of Rodico on that and then I put the seconds hand on that little piece of Rodico. And this gives me more control and enables me to get the seconds hand right on that tiny little pinion every single time because I can see exactly what I'm doing. So go ahead and press that on and we have our seconds hand installed now and uh, it just makes it much easier to install the seconds hand that way. So now I'm just checking from the side profile to check all of our clearances and make sure that Everything's looking good. And now I'm gonna go ahead and put a decent wind into the movement. That way it starts up and we can go ahead and make sure the seconds hand is running under its own power. So you can see it started up there. And I'm just gonna go ahead and let that run for a second and make sure that it can run over the minute hand under its own power and it doesn't come in contact with anything as it's going along. So I'm gonna go ahead and check from the side profile here and make sure that it goes right over that minute hand. It has plenty of clearance. And again, that it's running straight and true and uh, it's not coming into contact with anything. Now that we have our movement side of things complete, we can go ahead and move on to the case. This is a chapter ring from DLW watches. The case is from DLW as well. And this chapter ring matches this, this dial perfectly. It's got that brush, dark chocolate uh, brown look to it, and it matches perfectly. The good thing about this chapter ring is it has no marks on it because our dial has marks on it. So we don't have to align it with anything and there's actually no tab to align it either. So we're gonna go ahead and give the case a decent clean here 
just give it some air make sure there's nothing no little dust particles in there so going to give it a clean something i do want to point out uh here is on the crystal gasket i actually don't think i've even seen anybody point this out but there is a right way to install these i don't know if you can see it hopefully you can but right on the top there there's a little bevel edge and when i flip it over you can kind of get a better look see there's no bevel at the top there and i'll flip it back over and uh give it some contrast here and hopefully you can see the light gleam off of that little bevel edge there yeah you can see it pretty good from this angle see how the light follows that beveled edge that's the side we want to install the crystal gasket because that bevel is going to make it easier to install our crystal so we want to put it with that bevel edge up I just uh, push it past the case and then let it kind of uh, backfill itself in. So that's how I install the crystal gasket there. Then we're going to do some more cleaning because you can never clean too much. So get out any dust that could potentially be in there. And then we're going to go ahead and open up our crystal. This crystal is from Namokis. It is a double dome sapphire with clear AR coating on it. And when I open this up, I'm going to try to uh, put it right on the case and give it no chance to get any kind of dust or anything under it. So I'm going to get it set on the case there. And then we can go ahead and install it. So I use a 31 uh, millimeter size die on the top and I think a 42 millimeter die on the bottom. Uh, this crystal press is from eBay. It works pretty well and I'll leave a link to that in the description as well. Now we're going to go ahead and press and then turn and then we're going to give it another press and then turn and we're going to repeat that until uh, the crystal is all the way installed I like to turn the case you know a quarter turn at a time as I'm installing the crystal that way we get a nice even amount of pressure applied to the crystal so not only having the right die um, helps but also turning it as you're doing it um, is very useful and will ensure that the crystal goes in smooth and doesn't go in crooked or anything like that so now we have our crystal installed and we can get a better look at it so i want to look from the side here and make sure it's not visibly crooked or anything and it looks great to me I also want to look from this side and make sure that that black gasket on the outside for the crystal doesn't show any um, sign of being, you know, damaged. So now we have our crystal installed. We can go ahead and pop our crown out. So I'm going to go ahead and put the movement into the movement holder uh, upside down. So. Go ahead and install this dial side um, in. Go ahead and set it in there and then I'll go ahead and zoom in. I've showed this plenty of times and this is on plenty of channels. Um, so uh, this is how you remove the crown. If you weren't aware, most people are. So it's just this little liver there with that little dimple. Go ahead and press it in and pull the crown out. Now that we have our crown removed, we can go ahead and flip our movement back over and go ahead and remove it from the movement holder. And before we install it into the case, you guessed it, we're going to go ahead and give it another clean. 
with some air. So give it a couple puffs and make sure there's no dust on it. And now we can go ahead and get our case and install the movement into the case. And this is most people's favorite part, including mine. This is really where you get a sense of how the build is gonna look. And sometimes it looks so good. I think about leaving the bezel off. I'm just like, ah, maybe I could just leave it like this. But here's a better look at it. It does look great. Uh, I think this would have looked way better with an OEM dial. Such a shame that I paid almost $100 for this dial. Like I said, um, you know, it's not even much cheaper than what a real OEM one would be. It's just availability is uh, scarce on these. So now we can go ahead and cut our crown to size. And I want to measure it um, to about 13.6. And then uh, I'm going to cut it there. If I need to adjust it, I will, but I normally don't. I normally cut them all to about 13.6. Um, and uh, we're going to go ahead and use a pair of cutters here and just make sure it's straight. And then we'll go ahead and cut the crown. Just like that there is a little um, you know rough edge there left behind so I'm gonna sand this down I do sand it off camera that way I'm not getting more dust around my little work area here but hopefully you can see the crown now is, is sanded and, and flat and we can go ahead and install our crown onto the stem and once you have it sanded perfectly the crown will, will thread on perfectly um, once we have the crown threaded onto the stem, we can go ahead and lubricate our crown gaskets. You don't need much. And I'll just use a Q-tip cut at like a 45 degree angle, uh, to apply the silicone grease. Now we can go ahead and install our crown into the case. And we get it aligned in there and go ahead and pop the crown in. Sometimes I find myself having trouble finding the hole. That's what she said. Anyway, uh, we can go ahead and uh, thread our crown in and check that it is sealing tight up against the case. It's a little tricky with these finger cots on but there it is screwed down all the way. And then we're gonna go ahead and unthread it. And we have a nice pop. And I'm happy with the crown stem size. So um, good pop and it seals. So uh, like I said, normally 13.6 is about the area you wanna be in. But now that we have our crown installed, we're gonna go ahead and recheck all of our functions. So pull the crown out all the way to the time setting position and recheck our hand alignment at six o'clock. Then we'll go ahead and pop the crown back in and make sure that it's running uh, correctly. And then uh, we can go ahead and thread our crown back down. And again, it's a little tricky with finger cuts so I sped this part up, but there's the crown threading in. Decent crown action. You know, it's uh, pretty good when you can operate it with finger cots on. So now we're going to go ahead and lubricate our bezel gasket. In this case, because it is going to be a bi-directional bezel, I'm not installing a click spring. So we're going to go ahead and... Uh, get the other press here. I used to use this for crystals, but like I said, I use that other one because it gives more control, but I still use this one for bezels. And I pop that on, nice positive click. You want to hear when it's fully installed. 
and this is an LX style uh, bezel and I'm calling it now that Seiko is going to release um, a GMT that's going to look kind of similar to this one in the future uh, with uh, an LX style bezel, an MM200 style case, and this kind of dial as well. But I go ahead and pop the GMT bezel in. That way we can get a decent look at how this whole build is going to look. And it is coming out great. I wish that dial had that cream color loomed as well because it would have tied into this bezel insert perfectly. Go ahead and realign that just for, for mock-up and we'll go ahead and take a closer look at it. So this one is pretty good. You can see there's still a little lip between the bezel and the crystal. So when we install the, crystal, the uh, bezel all the way, I'm gonna use two adhesive rings. This one's not too bad. Sometimes I have to use more adhesive rings to bring up the bezel to the crystal. So we're gonna go ahead and install this first one here. Just peel it off. And I use tweezers because it does give you a little more control when you're installing it. Um, so get it aligned good. Go ahead and uh, make sure that it's not touching the crystal. So I go ahead and just go all the way around with it. And then we can uh, make sure that it's adhered all the way around the bezel. Just give it a nice firm press a couple times around. Make sure it's you know fully adhered. Then we can go ahead and peel this top portion of the 3M adhesive ring off. Go ahead and get that out of the way. Then I'll just go ahead and back in here and kind of dab these little spots so they're nice and flat and they're they're filled in nicely. So there we go with that. And like I said, we're going to install two of these because, like I said, as I was looking at it with the bezel insert installed, I figure it needs about two of them to be the perfect height where you get a good transition from crystal to bezel. So we'll go ahead and install our second one. And it's the same thing. Go all the way around it. Make sure that it is... Um, you know, fully adhered, and then we can go ahead and peel this top layer off. It's a little tricky sometimes. Got to get that out of the way. Now we can go ahead and install our bezel insert. So we'll go ahead and align this and then install, install it on. Give it a nice firm press. And make sure that it's, um, you know, fully adhered. And here's what I was talking about. You can see now that there is a seamless transition. It's so smooth you cannot even feel it with your finger. So that's the kind of transition I'm looking for. I know I say it a lot, but it is an important detail. So this build is almost done, but we are gonna go ahead and install an aftermarket rose gold rotor. And I don't think I'm gonna install any more uh, aftermarket rotors. We'll talk about that a little more in a second, but we're gonna install that. And I also have a display sapphire case back the slim version so should take away some of that thickness as well so we're going to go ahead and remove the case back here so we can gain access to the rotor as i was talking about um you know recently i did that batman gmt mod and it also has an aftermarket rotor 
And when you line the rotor up, you'll see that there's a little dot on this gear and it lines up with this post on the balance bridge. And Seiko says when you remove the rotor, uh, that dot should line up and when you reinstall it, it should line up. And you can see every time that I line the rotor up, no matter how many times I spin it around, that dot lines up with the, the post on the balance bridge. And when you install an aftermarket rotor, that dot no longer stays aligned after you rotate the rotor around. So we're gonna go ahead and remove it and I'll show you guys what I'm talking about. When I realized that I did a little experiment just on my own, it wasn't the most scientific, but I put a watch on with the aftermarket rotor and I put one on with a factory rotor. I did not wind them because I wanted to just test the winding efficiency. So I didn't wind the movement with the stem at all. I just let the rotor wind it for a few hours and I just put them both on, one on each wrist and wore them for the same amount of time. I took them both off and the one with the factory rotor did in fact run longer by a few hours. Now, the aftermarket rotor still does wind the movement and if you're you're active, you probably won't even notice a difference. You know, I wore them both for about four hours and both of them ran for over a day. But like I said, the one with the factory rotor ran for a whole day and then, you know, a total of four and a half hours longer than the aftermarket rotor. So that's just something to take into consideration. So. Now you can see I'm installing this uh, rotor on here um, and I'm going to show you that the dots are in fact aligned when I install this rotor um, but as I spin it you'll see that the dot is no longer aligned so when you install an aftermarket rotor you will no longer have the full efficiency of the winding rotor so you can see as I turn it around the first couple times, that dot does line up with the post. But as I continue to turn the rotor, I'll go ahead and show you the dot is no longer aligned. So, and it gets worse the more you spin it. You can see how far the dot off is now. If we spin it backwards, it does kind of try to realign itself, but you know, this is a bi-directional winding movement and like I showed before no matter which way you turn it it should line up so you know just something to consider when you're installing an aftermarket rotor I will be doing a, a full separate video on that um, so people are aware that when you install one you no longer have the full winding efficiency um, they are rotors that have no ball bearing pre-installed and they make use of your factory um, ball bearing and winding mechanism so that is something that I might consider on using in the future um, but for now I'm just gonna you know kind of not use aftermarket rotors so much so I already lubed up this case back gasket with silicone grease got that installed here and now we can go ahead and install our sapphire display case back. So this is a slim case back from Namoki's. Um, it still has 100 meters of water resistance, so you lose a little bit of water resistance. Uh, well, actually half, but you know, 100 meters is more than most people will need. And I think it's a fair trade-off because it does make it a little slimmer. Speaking of, I am going to try to use a slim bezel and crystal from the Mokis on a GMT. I'm not sure if it will work or not, uh, but I will test that in the future. Uh, when I install the case back, I do like to use a plastic bag over the case back. That way when you're tightening it up, the case back tightening tool doesn't slip off and scratch your case back. So that's a pro tip right there. Um, now, I'm just, you know, going over it one last time. 
I'm checking the crown functions and uh, the quick set on the date. So I have it pulled to the first position here. And I'm gonna go ahead and check the quick set, like I said. And I'm also gonna go ahead and recheck the jumping function of the GMT hand. So we're gonna go all the way around the dial, making sure that it jumps by hour increments and that it's you know lining up with all its um, corresponding spots. Go ahead and set it back to 12. So it's um, you know set to the same as our local time. And then I'm just gonna pull the crown out all the way to the time setting function and we just check everything and check the natural date change as well. So just rechecking that it changes over on its own and it changed right at 11.45. So about 15 minutes before 12, which is within the you know reasonable window of date change. So Happy with how it looks, all the hands line up, the watch is running great, and it looks great. Um, so really happy with how this turned out, regardless of that dial situation. And although the aftermarket rotor doesn't wind as well, they do look great. So now I'll go ahead and screw the crown back down. Crown operation is great, much easier to screw in without finger cots on. And uh, you know seals up nice and tight so I am going to throw this on a single pass khaki NATO with bronze hardware that matches and I uh, think it looks great single pass a little thinner but thanks for watching guys and I'll catch you in the next one <laughs>